participants. Uh, a, week ago, a few weeks ago, ICYF has launched uh, the online session program called the Intellectual Islamic Heritage, uh, seeing the through of the eyes of youth. And today we are delivering the fourth session in the program. And today we are delivering the fourth session of the program. And when ICYF thought to implement this program, uh, they, uh, we were mainly targeting the youth and we are keen uh, to reach our objective, which is uh, uh, aiming at promoting uh, so, uh, awareness about Muslim intellectual contribution to science and other fields like civilizations, arts and uh, cultural. Uh, the term cultural heritage has been changed considerably uh, in the recent decades. And it doesn't end at monuments and collections of objects. It also includes traditions and living expressions inherited from our ancestors and passed on to our descendants. The importance of intangible cultural heritage is not the cultural manifestation itself, but rather the wealth, uh, knowledge, and the skills that is transmitted through it uh, from one generation to another. The intangible cultural heritage is, uh, indicates the practices and representations, knowledge, skills, and other objects uh, that communities and individuals in somehow re must recognize in their cultural heritage. What can be regarded as intangible uh, cultural heritage and why is, uh, it is important to protect this intangible cultural heritage will be the pivots that our speaker will illustrate in her presentation. Our speaker for today is Turkish by origin, and she pursued her PhD degree from Gazi University, Turkish, uh, Turkish Folklore Department uh, in 2010. Uh, in fact, she has very rich CV and she has multiple experiences and she occupies several positions. I will try to mention some of them. Uh, she is a member for Expert Council of Islamic Cultural Heritage in the Ministry of Culture and Tourism. And she also the Secretary General of Intangible Cultural Heritage Institute in Turkey, in Ankara, uh, since 2012. Uh, she is working as a director uh, in the Intangible Heritage Museum in Ankara since 2012. Uh, she is uh, editor board member in Gazi University, Turkey Journal. She is also a member of ASISCO, Scientific Commission for Islamic Cultural Heritage. And finally, she is a member of Intangible Cultural Heritage in the Turkish National Commission for uh, UNESCO since 2011. I will not prolong in my introduction to, of the speaker in order to give her the space to speak and deliver her presentation. And before I start or she starts, uh, I would kindly request our audience to mute their uh, microphones. And if they have any question, please write them down in the question and answer box to address them to the speaker. Um, let us now welcome Dr. Evrim Uznil. Dr. Evrim, the place and time are yours. Thank you uh, very much to give me this space. Let me share my screen first. Uh, can you see my screen? Sorry, is, is there a technical problem? Um, okay. Oh. Now, doctor, we, yes, 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 we can yes. see it. Yeah. Thank you um, for inviting me for this important occasion because I'm, uh, youth is really important for me because it's the next generations. Uh, in Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention, it's um, repeatedly, they repeat always the generations to generations and this means the youth. So you're, it's very important for today that you are here. In my presentation, first I will, to, I want to talk a little bit about UNESCO, as you may know, and what is the importance of intangible cultural heritage uh, within UNESCO. And then maybe I will talk about some of the main safeguarding strategies for cultural heritage and cultural heritage management and what does it mean for UNESCO. And I'll, I will try to give some examples and good practices uh, which uh, will forward us to the future. So let's start. 
as you, uh, most of you know, uh, um, UNESCO is an intergovernmental organization with 195 member states. And it works in five sectors, which is education, natural sciences, social and human sciences, culture and communication, and information. And there are seven UNESCO conventions in the field of culture and heritage, which are tangible, intangible, and natural heritage, diversity of cultural expressions, and, uh, and the copyright. But uh, mainly there are three related UNESCO conventions on culture and heritage. Uh, one is uh, the 1973 convention, which is the concerning the protection of the world cultural and natural heritage. The other one is 2003 convention, which is the convention for the safeguarding of the intangible cultural heritage. And the third one, 2005, is the convention on the protection and promotion of the diversity of cultural expressions. But uh, we will focus on the second uh, one, 2003 convention today, uh, because it's deal it deals directly with the intangible cultural heritage. And the convention for the safeguarding um, of the intangible cultural heritage dates back to 2003, but already uh, ratified by 178 state parties, which is quite a lot. And um, for now, 549 elements inscribed corresponding to 127 countries, which is quite a lot again. And 193 elements from uh, this list is, belongs to Islamic world, which is also uh, very nice. And so what is intangible cultural heritage? Uh, intangible cultural heritage itself is a quite fragile heritage because when we lose it, we cannot see it. If you lose the uh, ruins and the monuments and buildings, we can see that uh, the dust and the ruins and the flames. So we can understand that this heritage uh, is demolishing. But when we lose this uh, intangible cultural heritage, uh, because it doesn't have flames, dusts, or ruins, we cannot recognize it quickly. So it just goes away from our lives. It goes in uh, after two generations, it becomes only a, uh, something only nostalgic uh, and we just remember in our memories, but we don't practice them. So it's a very fragile uh, type of heritage, in, but uh, is an important factor in maintaining cultural diversity in the face of growing globalization. An understanding of the intangible cultural heritage of different communities helps with intercultural dialogue and encourages mutual respect for other ways of life, which is also very important for the peace of this world. And the importance of intangible cultural heritage is not the cultural manifestation of itself, but rather the wealth of knowledge and skills that is transmitted through it from one generation to the next generation. So this means that intangible culture is uh, not just for us and not just for uh, now. Uh, it, it comes, uh, intangible heritage is also for future and for the next generations. And the convention's definition of intangible culture is, um, <laughs> Uh, the, it means the practices, representations, expressions, knowledge, skills, as well as the instruments, objects, artifacts, and cultural uh, spaces. Well, this cultural uh, space issue is also very important today because we are just losing the cultural spaces. Uh, highly rapidly urbanized world uh, in our rapidly uh, urbanized world. Uh, or our traditional buildings and lifestyles are demolishing. So um, we need to keep and protect also the cultural spaces in order to live and survive the uh, safeguard the intangible cultural heritage. And also our, our, in article 2.1 of the um, convention, this intangible cultural heritage transmitted from generation to generation is constantly 
recreated by communities and groups in response to their environment, their interaction with nature and their history and provides them with a sense of identity and continuity, thus promoting respect for cultural diversity and human creativity. When we look at this quotation, we can uh, highlight the transmitted from one generation to generation. And it is um, important that intangible cultural heritage, we have to remember that it's our roots. So uh, this, it, it gives us the sense of identity and continuity. Without the feeling of roots and the cultural code, we, we are kind of losing ourselves and our nature and our history and our environment within us and outside, outward, outer world. So it is very important to have that belonging and sense of identity uh, towards our intangible cultural heritage because it uh, connects us to our roots, which we can put, um, project it to the future. And we have some domains of ICH, which are the oral traditions and expressions performing arts and social practices, rituals and festive events, and knowledge and practices concerning nature and the universe, and traditional craftsmanship, which I will explain some, a little bit more. Uh, what I mean with oral expressions uh, is the oral traditions and expressions domain in, encompasses the enormous variety of spoken forms, including proverbs, riddles, tales, nursery rhymes, legends, myths, epic songs, and poems, charms, prayers, chants, songs, dramatic performances, and so more and more. So what is happening if we don't continue to use these oral uh, abilities? Oral traditions and expressions are used to pass on knowledge, cultural and social values, and collective memory. They play a crucial part in keeping cultures alive. So when we lose and forget all these oral uh, communication skills, we kind of um, lose our uh, culture. We kind of start to communicate with a very um, standardized ways. But once you are familiar with the oral culture, you're always flexible, your brains and your neurons are just uh, can understand your environment better. So it's very, it's crucial to keep these things alive, oral tradition alive. Because they are passed on by words of mouth, oral traditions and expressions often vary in their telling. This makes them colorful form of expression, but also fragile, as their reliability depends on an uninterrupted chain passing traditions from one generation of performance to the next. So it's, we can uh, again see the um, highlight of, we can still highlight the word uh, transmitting to next generation here. Like other forms of ICH, oral traditions are threatened by rapid urbanization, as I told you before like large scale of migration and environmental change and crisis. Books, newspapers and magazines, radio, television and the internet can have a, an especially damaging effect on oral traditions and expressions. Modern mass media may significantly alter or over replace traditional forms of oral expressions. For example, epic poems that once took several days to recite in full, maybe uh, reduced to just a few hours and traditional courtship songs that were sung before marriage, maybe replaced by CDs or just the digital music files. So the barrier and the performance and the um, element uh, silently goes away from our lives. The most important part of safeguarding oral traditions and expression is maintaining their everyday life and everyday role in our society. It is very important if we just archive them, if we just put them on archives or museums or in the books or in an articles or in a small uh, meetings, uh, this uh, means that our, we will lose our trad oral tradition because we need to take it as a um, part of our daily life, which is essential. 
And it's also a chance, essential that chances for elders to interact with young people and pass it on stories in homes or school. This is really very important because nowadays in our world, we don't have chance to see our elders and uh, we are missing their knowledge and wisdom and culture. So young generations and all elders should meet in cultural spaces to share their um, knowledge and wisdom and to transmit that knowledge is very important. And let's see what is performing arts. What do I mean with performing arts like traditional music, dance and theater? Are, uh, these uh, range from vocal and instrumental music, dance and theater to um, song, verse and beyond. So it's a very um, vast area also. They include the memories, cultural expressions that reflect human creativity and that are also found to some extent in many other intangible cultural heritage domains. Many forms of performing uh, arts are under the under threat uh, today also as cultural practices become standard designs. Many traditional practices are abandoned, even in cases where they become more popular, only certain expressions may benefit while others suffer. This is another important issue while we are safeguarding it. Music, dance and theater are often key features of cultural promotion intended to attract tourists and regularly uh, featuring the itineraries of tour operators. It is, you know, uh, it's a good attraction area for tourism. While tourism can give a market value to intangible cultural heritage, it can also have a distorting effect. It, is, it has a dark side, as the performances are often reduced to show adapted highlights in order to meet tourist demands. Uh, we are calling this as a touristification, which is a real threat for uh, safe, in safeguarding intangible cultural heritage. Because if you uh, make so, um, promotions about touristification of the element, we are losing the uh, core and we are losing the soul of the element and it, it becomes very touristic. So we have to be careful about this while safeguarding the heritage. So what I mean with these social practices, rituals and festive events, as you see, this uh, picture is from Uzbekistan. This is a cradle uh, the ceremony, uh, which we may see in many countries. Uh, so it's a very nice event when the baby borns, there's a cradle uh, um, ceremony for it. Like uh, social practices, rituals, and festive events are habitual activities that structure the lives of communities and groups and that are shared by and relevant to many of their members. Social ritual, ritual and festive practices may help to mark the passing of the season, events in the agricultural calendar or the stage of a person's life which are very important. I mean, we just born, we grow up and we die. And within this uh, process, within this uh, structured time, uh, we are um, always changing and we are initiating, we are becoming uh, and we are maturing, we are becoming a part of the community. So we have some rituals to become the part of our community. These kind of events and rituals uh, gives us the very, high and um, strong identity and belonging uh, feeling. So they are closely linked to a community's worldview and the perception of its own history and memory. Without the memory and without the history, we cannot survive. So uh, this intangible um, cultural heritage feeds our history and memory. Social practices, rituals, and festive events are strongly affected by the change, changes communities undergo in modern societies because they depend so much on the broad participation of practitioners and others in the communities themselves. Processes such as migration, the general introduction of formal education, and the other effects of globalization, globalization have a particularly marked effect on these practices. The viability of social practices, rituals, and especially festive events may also depend 
quite heavily on general socioeconomic conditions, the preparations, the production of costumes and masks and providing for the participants is often very expensive and may not be sustainable in times of economic downturns. Ensuring the continuity of social practices uh, often requires the mobilization of the large numbers of individuals and the social, political and legal institutions and mechanism of a society, while respecting customary practices that might limit participation to certain groups. It may also be desirable to encourage the broadest public participation possible. And what do I mean with knowledge and practices concerning nature and the universe? This is a very important uh, domain of ICH, according to me, because the, regarding to uh, Sustainable Development Goals 2030, which is very, this uh, knowledge and wisdom of uh, our um, ancestors are really important and essential, because uh, nowadays, Children think that tomato is grown in the refrigerator and the fridge. So they don't know how to put that seed into the soil and grow a tomato. Uh, but in these uh, Corona days, we realize that this is very important. If you don't, if we don't know this knowledge and if we don't have this knowledge, uh, wisdom inside us, uh, if we don't know how to, when and how to put that seed to that soil, uh, we may not survive as a humanity. So this the practices about nature and universe of ICH is a very important domain. They also strongly influence values and beliefs and underlie many social practices and cultural traditions. Traditional knowledge and practices are under serious threat. Of course, again, from globalization, rapid urbanization and extension of the agricultural lands can have a marked effect on a community's natural environment and their knowledge of it. Climate change, continued uh, defrost defrostration and the ongoing spread of deserts threaten many endangered species and result in the decline of the traditional craftsmanship and herbal medicine as raw materials and plant species disappear. So uh, when it disappears, we don't realize, but uh, maybe after 50 years, we will re realize that, oh, maybe it will be too late. Safeguarding a worldview or system of beliefs is even more challenging than preserving a natural environment. Protecting the natural environment is often closely linked to safeguarding a community's cosmology, as well as other examples of its intangible cultural heritage. And uh, about traditional craftsmanships, this is also the most fragile part of intangible cultural heritage because it has it consists many threats. Like if you over commercialize the craftsmanship, if you uh, do the mass production, you will lose both the barrier and the craft itself. So it's a, it's a very complicated issue. Uh, globalization possess significant challenges to survival of traditional forms of craftsmanship. Many craftspeople struggle to adapt to mass production competition. Yeah. Environmental and climatic pressures impact on traditional craftsmanship too. Even in the cases where traditional artisanship develops into a cottage industry, the increased scale of production may result in damage to the environment. So further legal measures such as intellectual property protection and patent or copyright registrations can help a community to benefit from its traditional motives and crafts. Sometimes legal measures intended for other purposes can encourage craft production. For example, a local ban or wasteful plastic bags can stimulate a market for handmade paper bags and containers woven from grass, allowing, tra allowing traditional crafts, skills, and knowledge to thrive. So, uh, these are the these were the domains of ICH. I just wanted to explain briefly. 
And when you look at the Islamic countries, there are 195 elements inscribed on the UNESCO list. Uh, um, so quickly, I can show you how many countries and how many. And then I'll, when it comes to Turkey, we have 18 um, elements inscribed on the list and one is the, in the urgent safeguarding list of intangible cultural heritage. I want to show you the photos, which is Medda, the arts of Medda, the public storytelling, which brings us together and which brings us our oral, uh, which reminds us our oral communication skills again. Uh, Mevlevi Sema ceremony, as you know, is a very uh, profound and mystic ritual, uh, Mevlevi rituals. And Sema Alevi Bektaşı ritual is another element which is inscribed. And Karagöz's set of puppet theater. And minstrelly tradition uh, is very um, popular, still popular in Turkey, but it has some threads also, like the Trustification and standardization, deconstructualization is the threats of this minstrel tradition. Uh, traditional sopet means me meetings, I mean, the gatherings of men. They gather together and so all night they sing and they uh, make sopet and they tell hikaya to each other, which is, uh, is a very um, popular way of. Um, spending time within the community. And Nevrus is a multinational file. Uh, in our um, region, in many countries, Nevrus is a, a festive event and we are celebrating the spring and the joy of spring with Nevrus. And it means a lot. And the roots of Nevrus is quite deep in these uh, lands. Also this festival, uh, Dates back 600 years ago, and which is very popular, still continues. And there's the, the um, oil wrestling festival. It uh, dates back to 600 years ago. Uh, recently, I I was watching TV and I saw the, one of these um, Pahlavans talking on the screen and saying that, I am very sorry for this year because of COVID, if we cannot uh, continue, I, I regret this because even in the war time, we practice this uh, festival. So we will do it symbolically again. So nothing um, in these Corona days, we realize that nothing uh, can stop culture, the need of culture. So we are still practicing our cultural needs in every condition. And this ceremonial Keshkek tradition also has a very deep root and men and women work together and they, this is a ceremonial food. But they, we can see this Keshkek in many traditions also. And the Turkish coffee culture and tradition. Coffee, it's more than a, a drink and a, it's something beyond drink. A, um, and it has many in cultural sites, for example, once you go and you want to marry and you go to the uh, future bride's house with your family and when you mm, ask a permission from the father and the elders, uh, after uh, they accept it, and the future bride brings coffee to the groom, but it puts she puts some salt in it and give it to the <laughs> groom. <laughs> So if he drinks, this means that uh, their marriage will survive. So it's a, that kind of joke and it's a kind of a joyful expression of um, the culture. And beyond that, of course, about we can talk uh, more about Turkish coffee culture. And the style, uh, is art of tile, is chini. Chini is also very important in Turkey. And art of marbling, which is, uh, I mean, what I feel is uh, when we look at Islamic countries and Islamic world in um, our world, some people say it's a mosaic, 
Now it's not a mosaic, it's an ebro, it's a marbling. Once you mix them, you cannot come detach them. It's always um, uh, layer by layer, it's inside and it's a mixture of culture and faith and rituals and everything. So when I look at this marbling art, I always see the depths of this uh, wisdom of Islamic culture. And the Korkut is also a, an epic um, and poetic in singing and telling stories, which is very important. And Lavash is a flat bread, ma uh, bread making is also an, an another important cultural heritage for Turkey. And whistle language is in our in endangered list. Uh, with <laughs> these uh, people can communicate with whistling in they are trying to transmit their culture to next generations. And this year in Colombia, this um, Turkish traditional archery has been inscribed to intangible, inscribed to intangible cultural heritage list, which is also this archery, to traditional Turkish archery dates and roots back. So what else to say? So, uh, let's go back to the uh, key safeguarding measures. Uh, the, there are three points in this convention, which is awareness raising, means encouraging people to understand and appreciate ICH, revitalization, which is strengthening of endangered ICH practices. I mean, you can revitalize one element, like um, if your grandmother remembers, and if she practiced, you can revitalize. But if your grandmother and the mother of your grandmother doesn't remember, but we can only see from the books or the manuscripts, this means that the, you cannot revitalize this tradition again, according to this convention. But you can revitalize if some people remembers or practiced and those kind of things. But this is a um, um, very... I mean, important issue, what will you revitalize? If you revitalize uh, the very old tradition, which is not existing anymore, this is uh, not very appropriate because it, uh, it's a, an intangible cultural heritage is a living cultural heritage. So once it's not living, you cannot revitalize. And another um, safeguard, key safeguarding measure of this convention is inventory you have to collect and make very um, good inventories uh, of these um, elements, presenting information of ICH elements in systematic way. If it's not systematic, you will lose it again. But uh, every country should make his, uh, his um, own inventory in order to uh, be sure that it will stay there systematically. And more, of course, documentation, research, identification, definition, preservation, protection, promotion, transmission, uh, and true education is also a very uh, important issue. Um, but uh, sus for the say sustainable, the point is uh, when you are safeguarding, you need sustainable safeguarding uh, measures, like museums are one of them, which I'm running in Ankara, uh, research and application centers uh, related with universities or some NGOs is important. National inventory is very important. Heritage on ICH is another way of uh, safeguarding, but it's not enough. Once you put the element and once you inscribe that element to that list, uh, your job begins, not finishes. So after you are putting the heritage on the inscribing the element on the list, you have to make very um, appropriate safeguarding plans to transmit to the next generation. Of course, scientific field works are important. Multinational files are really important because we have um, many elements in common, especially with uh, in regional um, contexts. So UNESCO allows us to make multinational files, which means that we are celebrating and we are uh, safeguarding uh, this heritage with five different countries, which is, uh, which, um, is good for the peace and the intercultural uh, relations. 
of course, education is important. And there are some UNESCO and UNITWIN, UNESCO chairs and UNITWIN networks in, within the UNESCO concept. Um, we have a, a chair at, uh, in my university. So within uh, through this chair or UNESCO chair, we can exchange e experts and we can organize summer schools and winter schools so people can communicate with different cultures, especially our students. It's very helpful. Of course, media, if media supports your work and safeguarding plans, you, you can succeed more. Awareness raising is important and regional cooperation, as I told before, is also important. So intangible cultural heritage have the power to promote dialogue and mutual understanding, enhance cohesion, strength, resilience, empower individuals and communities to rebuild their societies after disasters. After COVID, I'm really curious what will, I mean, we do. Uh, we stayed at our homes. We, uh, I mean, Eid is a very important thing for us, but we were all in our homes homes and on so then we saw that it's our memory it's our fate and it's on our roots so we really uh, realized in these disasters and urgent days that we need our we need to hold our culture and faith and beliefs more than ever and revitalize the public and cultural life continuously for intangible uh, to be kept alive, it must remain relevant to a culture and be regularly practiced and learned within communities and between generations. And this requires holistic involvement. I mean, you cannot safeguard the um, ICH by yourself. You need to, um, the involvement, the community involvement, involvement, youth participation and media participation is very and really important. So holistic involvement while you're safeguarding is important. Barriers, NGOs, governmental, private sector, expert consultancy, political support, uh, practitioners, individuals, and youth especially. Because if you, um, if you doesn't, uh, support and doesn't work for this uh, intangible cultural heritage <laughs> whatever we do uh, it will not work so youth is the um, key element of this uh, regarding to transmitting the generation the uh, culture to transmission uh, generation sorry uh, so intangible cultural heritage is a living heritage always changing you cannot stop it you cannot freeze it you cannot uh, uh, lock down the the ICH. It's uh, in it's na it is nature is like this. I mean, it has to change. Oh, it always changes. It's a dynamic uh, process. So defined, recognized, practiced, and transmitted by the people who are the stewards of that heritage. Safeguarding involves assisting communities to continue practicing managing and transmitting their ICH. So if we have time, let me check the time. Um, I will show you all, I can show you some pictures because it's a good example of, for safeguarding intangible cultural heritage in an urbanized city like Ankara, the capital I live in Ankara. So uh, Ankara is a very um, marginalized and metropolitan city so uh, a lot of people uh, migrated to the city and this uh, museum is kind of like a cultural hub within in the center of the city people are coming uh, to this museum and experiencing the intangible cultural heritage and it's uh, this museum ran by our students volunteer students and youth uh, they just love, love, love to be in this museum. I will show you some uh, of our activities. Actually, we have two museums. One is in, in an old building and one is in the, uh, inside the university. Um, yes, let's see. Yeah, so our safeguarding approach is the, the main um, 
exhibition method is to establish a connection between the objects and the oral culture. I mean, once we show the object, we always tell the story of that object and um, the history of this object and the memories about this object. And these are all made by our students, our volunteer students, as you can see in that photo. She is uh, our um, master degree students and she tells stories about the, all the objects, puppets and the po um, other things in the museum to the children. Uh, our activity is diverse in, in, in many categories, categories like revitalization, accessibility, mobility, awareness raising, participation, intercultural dialogue, disadvantaged groups and projects and so on. Let me show you like the Crocus Day. The, I don't know if you know this day is a very um, naive festival. Um, once you, in the springtime, you see a um, yellow flowers, which is, they are crocus. We celebrate that just the, them around, we have a festival around that flower, which means our spring is coming. So we revitalize this tradition in our museum. So these are all young people celebrating and teaching um, others about the Crocus Day Festival. And the spring uh, celebration hydrellas also ran by our students in a, uh, in a park nearby our museum. And accessibility, mobility, awareness, raising participation, visitors group from nursing home. Uh, the, our elders are coming to our museum. And sometimes we go there with our students. We go to their uh, nursing houses. And we, we also go to schools to tell stories and uh, make some uh, traditional puppet shows. And we also um, participate the Atmosphere Cultural Festival. And also do, we invite our elders to our museum to tell stories. Uh, so the young generation will uh, is having a chance to meet with the elder generations and the traditions. In, um, intercultural dialogue. Uh, sometimes we invite uh, minstrels from other countries. Once we invited minstrels from Poland and uh, also from Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan minstrels and then barriers, I mean, tradition barriers are coming to our museums and we make some small per, uh, performances. Uh, so, and disadvantages the groups, we go and visit the hospital of the foundation for children with leukemia, which was a very um, heartbreaking and, you know, it's a very, it, it, it's a very good feeling to see how these children are happy with the art tales and children's games. And also these are all run by our volunteer students. And again, nursing, how we sometimes come together with our elders and let's knit for the refugee children. Uh, we knitted some um, hats and flowers and uh, so on and for the refugee children and sent them to refugee camps. And we have many activities regarding to sustainable development goals like um, traditional basket weaving workshops, the traditional toys workshop with recycled materials. So these are all for um, the de uh, sustainable development goals. And other workshops like traditional toys, soap making, traditional ornaments, and so on. Okay, I think, yes, we can skip this, but this is another good pro example of project. If you're interested, you can see from the internet, one uh, master, thousand master, Yes. Okay. So, youth for UNESCO. 
Mm. According to UNESCO, youth is not, I mean, not the problem. Youth are uh, not the problem. They are the source and they are not the target group. They, um, they are the stakeholders of the heritage, which is very important. Mm. So you have to share the safeguarding plans. You have to in, uh, make new innovations about these plans. You have to involve these, all these processes. Mm -hmm. There are many, many uh, youth platforms and youth uh, uh, gatherings in, within UNESCO. So I think I can finish my words here. I have some more. Oh. Okay, let me finish. And if you have questions, I can answer. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Evrim, for this uh, uh, comprehensive presentation. Uh, I am quite confident that uh, this presentation has added some new knowledge to what uh, the participants have already in their uh, background. So let's start and open the floors for question. Uh, there is a question from uh, Kadirhan Özdemir. Um, the question is, what is the role of museums to protect the intangible cultural heritage? <laughs> I think I explained it in my presentation. Yes. <laughs> so do I uh, really need to repeat or no? No, just very no. Uh, in summary, yeah. Annie. Yeah. yeah, it's just that, yeah. Museums are just like, as I told before, and they are the cultural hubs in the center of the city so that pe people can reach, people can access to the culture. So these are, this is the main role of museums in the big cities now. And it's so live, it's a living museum. It's, you, you, can, you can touch, you can join the activities. It's like a workshop. Everything is consists of home workshops. So uh, once you have the accessibility to the culture in your modern life, this is important. This is the role of the ICH museums in big cities now. Okay, thank you. There is another question. How can individual from different parts of the world contribute to the registration of intangible cultural heritage oh. without being formally involved in a profession related to cultural and heritage? Uh, it's, you know, um, UNESCO works with governments, NGOs and um, municipalities and universities. So you have to involve one of these. And if, I don't know which country, uh, it depends on the country. For example, in Turkey, if there are some courts and there are some expert um, councils in every city. So once you think that it is a, your intangible cultural heritage, your community's intangible cultural heritage, you can apply to them and they apply to ministry and ministry considers them the processes like this. But uh, it depends on the country. Okay, there is another question from Maria Malpelushi, but um, actually the question, I don't know if it is within your domain, but let me ask it. Uh, are there cases of intangible cultural heritage that either failed or succeeded in recognizing the local dishes of particular nations uh, based on which criteria, if yes? I mean, the, um, if I understand it right, Yes, uh, I, the, of course, it, um, food is an important domain of ICH. And there are many, many, if they can check the list, they can see the uh, um, some dishes in the intangible cultural heritage list. But sometimes it uh, succeeds, yes, and the uh, safeguarding processes. But it again depends on the country and your uh, safeguarding plans of your country. Okay, there is another question, but uh, I'm sure that the answer that it was in the presentation, but let me ask it. What are the steps uh, that we can follow to uh, or we need to safeguard the intangible cultural heritage? Uh, just be aware mm -hmm. and just know of your culture. 
be be curious about your culture, dig your culture, and find out what is valuable for you. And struggle uh, if even if you have you struggle, you tr um, you revitalize. Try to revitalize that tradition. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, another question: What makes intangible cultural heritage different from the tangible ones? Um, I tried to explain, but let's let me give a very simple uh, example. For example, mm -hmm. assume this is a tea. Uh, not tea, but it's a, it, let's think it's a tea. We can uh, touch the this. We can see the color. We can smell it. But beyond this, without this tea, we cannot survive. Like uh, once we met with our friends, we need tea. Once we sit in our houses, when we want to relax, we need tea. After breakfast, we need tea. So this is the intangible part. We can see this is a tangible. We can see, smell, touch, but we cannot see the feeling of this gathering and belonging and identity. That part is the intangible part of the heritage. Okay, what are the threats of the intangible heritage? Oh, threats, as I told you. Uh, <laughs> the urbanization, the contextualization, touristification, museification, I mean, making fake uh, uh, lores, fake lore, fake lore is another threat, and over commercialization, about especially for the handcraft. If you just uh, sell it everywhere and if you just mass product, then the barrier you lose its position. So mm, there are many, many dark sides and threats of, but we need to, mm, we can find solutions. We are trying to find. Okay. Why should we protect intangible cultural heritage? <laughs> what, what should I say now? <laughs> yeah, because it's our roots. We, without roots, you cannot be balanced. You cannot walk without your feet, foot. Yeah. Now, once you, you, if you cannot step on the ground, like, <clears throat> like a tree, imagine a tree. Um, um, Tree has roots and the branches and the fruits and the uh, leaves. But if the FA tree doesn't have the root, there will be no branches, no leaves, and it will just collapse. In order not to collapse culturally in yes. this globalized world, we need to safeguard this intangible cultural heritage. Okay, thank you, doctor. Uh, I think we came and we are running out of time. We came to the end, but we, would you like to say a final word or give an advice to encourage uh, the youth to approach their past heritage uh, in different fields of science, culture, civilization, and to help them to strengthen uh, the identity of Muslim youth, especially with regards to internationalization? Yes. What I can say, oops, what is it? Protect your past to define the present and guide the future because you are youth. I mean, you have the power. You will guide us to future. We will just show you mm, the way maybe, but you have to walk through that road. So build and guide the future with your intangible cultural heritage. Thank you very much. Yeah, welcome, doctor. Uh, thank you very much, doctor, for your time and for accepting to be with us today. Um, thank you, our nice. thank you so much, and thank you, our participants who joined us today and uh, they interacted us uh, with uh, some questions. Uh, I would like to highlight that we are having uh, future uh, programs uh, online, and we are preparing to launch them very soon. So please. Um, follow up our social media and join us in the future uh, uh, sessions of the program. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you, our participants you. and Thank audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.